thank you so much, John, for having me here. Really important and exciting uh, event going on in New Zealand, and I am learning a lot to take back with me over the Tasman to Australia. This is my second trip over here in a month, actually. Um, we had a family holiday here. Uh, a fantastic time up at Coromandel where it says hot water beach. It's not, that is an understatement. Hot was, ow, scorching, and <laughs> I can still feel that. Beautiful place, absolutely beautiful place, and uh, really thrilled to be back. So the, the work I want to share with you this morning is, is some of the work we do at CSIRO. We're the National Science Agency in Australia with 5,500 staff across pretty well all scientific disciplines, um, growing continuously into new areas. Uh, I'm in Data61, the data science part of that, which does robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, there's about a thousand researchers. We just merged um, 600 researchers in NICTA, uh, which is uh, an ICT research body with the CSIRO one to create a thousand researchers, so it's a powerhouse in that area, and it's, it's one of the big growth areas. And it will overlap a bit, I think, with the sort of challenges that are in front of New Zealand. A mega trend is a gradual shift in the environment that plays out over a five to 20 year period. We started this work in CSIRO back in 2009, actually, when we first released, the first release of our report, Our Future World, was in 2010, where the chief executive, Megan Clark, at the time, wanted to have some thinking about long-term patterns of change to direct current day investments. What should we spend the budget on to deliver solutions for current and future generations of Australians was uh, the question. So we wanted to flesh out long-term patterns of change. We studied Shell's scenario planning techniques and landed on a concept of megatrends put forward by a US academic, John Naisbitt, in his book of the same title, 1984, it came out. And it um, uh, talks about these, these gradual shifts, like the, the frog being brought to boil in water is the analogy we sometimes use, but that's mean to frogs. So I, I'm from Queensland and I'll do a cane toad and no one cares. So a cane toad, um, biosecurity pest. And CSIRO didn't do that actually. We were the guys who were brought in to clean up the cane toad mess, but everyone thought it was our fault afterwards. It's not fair. Um, so initially the water feels pretty warm, the temperature rises, and then gradually reaches a point where it's too hot spoiled and can't escape, pretty well what happened to me on the Coromandel Peninsula. Uh, but the, the thing is if the, the, the toad is put into, thrown into already boiling water, the temperature shock gives it a chance to scamper out. Uh, and this is a gradual shift, the mega trend that Eastman Kodak, the film company faced, built up gradually um, and eventually once it had it in its grips and there were uh, mobile phones which had the ability to take a high quality picture, distribute that everywhere, their business model was gone and they filed for bankruptcy in 2011. The actions had to occur in the, in the early to mid 1990s for it to be able to withstand that change. So that is the concept of a mega trend and in our methods we open up this website to all our 5,500 staff and a lot of them were putting on trends patterns of change that they were observing in so many different fields and we classify them as geopolitical, economic environment, social and technological. And as we bring them together we, where they coalesce and create a more significant deep set trajectory of change that becomes the concept of the mega trend. Now um, the current report that we have, uh, the, well actually the, the next release of the report Our Future World will happen this year uh, and it contains these uh, six megatrends here, which I want to go through today with a bit of a focus on, on food and agriculture because yes, so much of what you're tackling earlier is, you know, given time we will start to pick up too over the other side of the Tasman because we need to. So the first megatrend we call More From Less and this is about the scarcity of food, mineral, energy and water resources relative to demand. The human population's crossed its 7 billion persons threshold, asymptotes out to 10 billion people midway through the century. Incomes rise from about 14,000 GDP per capita day in US dollars to 44,000 by the year 2060, according to OECD long range economic forecasts. Um, it's a much wealthier world in that 1.02 billion people in Asia cross an income threshold from being poor to middle income class over the next 10 year period. So that more people with more buying power translates to increased demand for those underlying food, water, mineral, energy resources. Um, food and agriculture organisation forecasts we've got to make 70% more food by 2050 to be able to feed this growing population of, of more people, increased per capita calorie consumption and as John has already pointed out, diet diversification and this, this changed nature of what they're eating across Asia as well. Planetary pushback is where we handle the changes to the Earth's environment at the, the global and microbial level. So climate change is a well-known story. The actual versus predicted lines are following each other pretty closely. 
um, February, the hottest month on record for the world this year. Um, we, we are moving into a hotter world, one, 1 to 1.5 degrees hotter across Australia, at least I know the modelling, by the year 2050 with more variable climate. The microbial end of the scale, we've changed the way things work too. We have the phenomena of antimicrobial drug resistance. Now, the good thing about that one is it will make you stop worrying about climate change. The other thing is pretty well everything else that's bad about it because it overtakes by 2050 cancer as a cause of mortality for humans. Um, this is the way we have excessively used and incorrectly used antibiotics has fueled the, the growth in the species of bacteria that are now resistant to all known forms of antibiotics. My little brother's head of physician, he's a physician, head of infectious diseases at Royal Brisbane Hospital. He lost another patient um, who was a, a man in his late 30s who'd come back from Thailand with an infection that, that they couldn't treat. It did not respond to any of the antibiotics they gave that, that person. So the other part of this challenge is uh, drug companies aren't putting out fresh ranges of antibiotics. We haven't seen for 30 years a new class of antibiotics put on the market. It's just really tinkering with existing ones in that the returns on investment there aren't strong as some of the lifestyle drugs that um, and chronic illness sort, sort of drugs. So there is a big challenge for humanity there. The Silk Highway tells the story of the changing world economy, how the rapid and continued rates of growth in Asia with India and China, these massive economies, and China's in purchasing power parity terms in 2015 got bigger than the US economy, which breaks a 140 year period that the US economy was the world's largest. In GDP per capita in the US economy is still way above what it is in China, but in terms of pure economic output, China has now become the largest. And we've also seen the services sector last year get bigger than the manufacturing sector and industry sectors of the Chinese economy. So it's, it's changing what it looks like inside there. And that's really the story of the Silk Highway. We're taking a bit of the weight off the well-known sort of growth in wealth and, and, and rapid rates of income growth there onto the structural change that's happening inside that economy. And I'm going to show you some graphs and ideas about what that looks like. Forever Young is about the ageing population. In Australia, we go from 14% over 65 to 24% over 65 by the year 2050. I'm not sure what the forecast is here, but I imagine it's towards a more aged New Zealand. Uh, worldwide, this is happening. It's happening in China as well as moving to a more aged demographic. In Japan, they will be 40% over the age of 70 by 2050, uh, which has big issues for the productivity of the workforce because so many people are in retirement, not, not doing jobs. Forever Young also captures rising rates of chronic illness, the increase in um, overweight and obesity that we're seeing um, across OECD countries. That is, the, the rates of growth of that have slowed, but they still continue. Australia goes from 50% overweight obese today to 70% by 2025 alone. Similar trends exist for the United States, parts of Europe, southern Mediterranean countries aren't doing so badly there. Uh, but there is definitely a, a, a big sort of diet and lifestyle related illness that the, world, that the OECD countries across the world face. And it's associated with insurmountable, unsustainable growth in healthcare costs. Um, you know, in my state of Queensland, we can draw a straight line projection through healthcare expenditure rise. That means the whole Queensland government budget will be spent on healthcare by another 20 years time only. And that, that won't happen, it can't happen, but somewhere the system breaks. Digital immersion is something that captures so much of the team's time now that I'm, I'm growing this strategic foresight team. And we, we're continually focused on companies and governments approaching us with the who's my Uber question. Who's the technology enabled digital startup that can do what we do more efficiently and effectively via clever use of information technology. The business landscape is gonna change a lot uh, because of digital disruption. Porous boundaries is really what happens institutionally and I think we see uh, the, uh, the theory of the firm that Ronald Coase won the Nobel Prize for about why labour was grouped into large organisations and that became the most efficient m mechanism for, for uh, organising economic activity. We're starting to see that challenge by the peer-to-peer -peer economy which is taking away the transaction costs and the asymmetries of information that create the, um, the, the theory of the firm. The last one is great expectations and this is the uh, consumer in, in this digitally immersed world that we're, we're moving into, the real gets more important and it's the consumer expectation for experience and end of product good that they consume. What's the real value that we deliver to the, to the consumer of the future? And at the end there we put this concept here, the innovation imperative that we've written to a bit in that um, I'd agree with the Tyler Cowan analysis in his book, The Great Stagnation. Uh, how America ate all of the low-hanging fruit of recent history, got sick and will get better again is the second line to that book. But he argues that we've done a lot of good stuff to create wealth and prosperity last century, but it was readily available 
um, high-grade mineral ore reserves, water reserves, skilled migrant labour, uh, and, and markets opening up that were, were there and we saw productivity gains. Now, a lot of the OECD countries have got multi-factor productivity up to a peak, but it's, it's plateauing, or in Australia's case, it's even declining. Um, the what next bit lies ahead of us and it's deeper, bolder, newer innovation and part of that happens in the high value nu nutrition space. I'm going to jump into some data and facts that back up this story but before I do, why a Venn diagram? This happened to us on the Coromandel Peninsula too. So we have three megatrends of ice cream, children and car trip. There are strategic responses we can deliver where we bring ice cream and children together, we can use serviettes and we can survive that. If we put ice cream and car trip together, two responsible adults can take normal care and become okay. And children and car trip, use of activity books and games and endless ice buy with my little eye, tea and a tree again. <laughs> that, that can be managed too. But in the centre there, anyone who's a parent who's tried that will know there's no alternative to a sticky mess. And should those roads be highly windy, as they sometimes are in them, it can also end with vomit in your favourite hat. <laughs> So, more from less. What sits behind this one? This is what food prices have done up to 2015. They're on their way down again, but they have, in recent times, hit some really high peaks, which were actually humanitarian crises, as poor households in the developing world spend 80% plus their income on food, so when prices spike, they can't stop buying movie tickets, get more food, it translates to starvation quite quickly. But the best remedy to high food prices may have been high food prices because of the production signals that sent to the world's uh, pr producers. You know, we may be in for more spikes, but it's the, the really the supply and demand drivers are in place and that the world is, is losing agricultural land every year, roughly 12 million hectares, which would have made 20 million tonnes of grain if it stayed in production. But the, you know, in a recent study, um, Dr. Sandra Edia, a colleague of mine at CSIRO, was given the question again, can the world feed itself? Uh, and the answer is yes, even with modest improvements in innovation, because of what lies around us in terms of how food is produced. Now, this is probably a more extreme example that I like to use, but is, is a good one, I think, of, of the shifts in the way we make food. So that hamburger involves no cow after the stem cells have been extracted and is fully grown in a petri dish in a laboratory. Um, now, uh, Professor Post and his team, when they first did it in London 2013, and you know went down pretty well with the tasters who, who did it. One of them complained it didn't it tastes right, not enough fat content, but they've taken the fat content down to make it healthy because they can control for it. Um, the downside as well was that it cost $450,000 to buy a hamburger, which put it out of reach of a lot of Londoners. However, Post, Dr. Post and his team from Amsterdam were challenged with, with today's technology and putting economies of scale around this. So wrap a whole industry doing this around this with your, you know, where we are today with the technology, how much it cost. He actually announced this when he came out to Australia to present to the Australian Cattlemen's Association up in Darwin, and he got out alive somehow. <laughs> um, I think it's quite brave, and it's exactly what where there is a technology disruptor, always bring it into the tent. Uh, it's actually a really smart strategy. So his, his answer is $80 a kilogram, and we know how this drastically reduces water, energy, land, and GHG, and greenhouse gas emissions as well. This is a much more efficient production mechanism um, if, if it happens. So it's a radical shift in people's minds about how we would make meat, but is technically feasible. Uh, energy, uh, probably, you know, there's, there's a massive story under energy here as well. I'm going to pull out the battery story because I think that is what is about to change the way the electricity grid works. So Tesla have shown up in Australia. I'm not sure if they're here selling their $6,000, sorry, five to $6,000 battery that gets put on the side of the house and plugged into the solar panels. Um, friends of mine in Syria have done the modelling on it, suggest two or three of these batteries is probably needed for most households to be able to cut the grid. But there is a feasible prospect that we can cut the grid and prices of those batteries may come down. That's forecast there from about eight different um, economic forecasts of what batteries will cost in dollars per kilowatt hour out of the, the battery. Um, it's going to come down and there could be some big shifts that cause it to drop. You know, that's sort of based on, on current paradigms and improvements in batteries, but there's always a prospect of a big shift. So what happens to the electricity grid here is this concept of the death spiral. It doesn't, I'll afterwards say, it doesn't quite work that way, but let's say Tesla are here and all the other battery manufacturers, are, they're not the only ones, they're probably a big player in the marketplace. They're, they're selling batteries and early adopters just go off grid. It's illegal to do that in Australia actually, but if you, I'm not sure about here, but the way is to not pay your power bill and then they cut you off the grid and then it's legal. That's how, that's how you can do it. So, they, so the first 5% early adopters go off grid, get the battery and the solar panels. 
Um, that means the electricity generation company loses some of its economies of scale. It's mostly just does fixed costs. It doesn't have much of a variable cost component, poles and wires, and running those generators to keep those peaks of demand. So, so it still has to face all the same costs, but it's lost a bit of revenue base. It's got to push up prices. This incentivizes the next 5% of consumers' electricity to drop off the grid because electricity just got more expensive, which again pushes the price up and it spirals to the point where people cannot go off grid because they're living in an apartment and they don't have the option of solar panels or it's an industrial aluminium smelter and it doesn't have enough, it can't get enough power from solar panels to be able to do what it needs to do. So then electricity costs a lot more for those consumers. So that's the concept of the electricity technology about to disrupt the way the electricity grid works. Um, it's not as simple as that and how it plays out. It could be if it gets the rich customers off the grid first, because they're the ones who can afford the batteries, that, that's good because they're the ones who contribute most to those peaks in demand. So there could be some efficiencies. But it's, it's likely the electricity grid looks a lot different by 10 years' time. Um, the Tesla PS90D as well makes it from 0 to 100 kilometres in 2.9 seconds, which a Ferrari does in 3 seconds. Uh, and that's to point out there's no, um, there's no uh, like productivity or efficiency loss. There's no, we're not giving anything up as we turn towards electric power for, for transportation or, or a lot of other applications. Mining above the ground is likely to become a reality here. So mineral ore, the more from less is that mineral ore grades are in gradual permanent decline. If you dug up a tonne of ore containing gold in Australia in 1800, you got about 50 grams of gold out of it. Today you get um, between one to five, usually around three grams of gold. Um, but one tonne of old computer circuits yields 250 grams of gold. So it's a much higher, sh now it's a much harder waste stream to process because it's difficult to get the gold out of it. But again, that's something where the innovation imperative comes into play and there's a lot of researchers around Australia and the world working out how to do that. The story of planetary pushback, that's the NASA map for February this year, which is showing us how uh, the actual is following predicted. All those red blobs show uh, an anomalous way above a long-term average heat signal, um, it, it's happening. Uh, and we are moving towards a, um, you know, February was the hottest on record. Um, 2015 was the hottest on record. 2016 is off to a good start to even top that. So, so we're moving towards a hotter world and that's the antimicrobial resistance story with um, uh, a forecast out to 2050 of deaths attributable to that in the absence of changes in the environment. Now, I'm very confident, though, that we see those changes. Again, uh, this is the innovation imperative. Researchers around the world are responding. Um, there, is, there is some work for governments to respond, and as China get the G20 presidency, I hope that that is put firmly on the agenda as one of the top items, because this is a challenge for humanity. Silk Highway, that's Singapore, who built a port before a port was needed, and they are now moving very quickly into knowledge economy opportunities and service opportunities of the, the new Asian economy. Um, this map here shows the hotspot of global GDP. Now, Danny Kwa is an academic London School of Economics and his algorithms, like imagine that map as a fry pan and instead of emanating heat, all the countries are emanating economic output, which is GDP. Um, it would be hottest in 1980. The hot point is uh, the, in the Atlantic Ocean between the powerhouses of the United States and Europe. In 2010, it's over Saudi Arabia. 2030, it's between India and China, as the whole world economy has been dragged in an easterly and somewhat southerly direction um, due to the, the rapid growth, which is great for Australia and New Zealand. It's in our backyard. It's happening fast. Um, it's Shenzhen in 1982 and then Shenzhen in 2007. So 7 million people um, built at a skyscraper a day and a boulevard a week during the 1990s. Uh, and a very different economy now exists there. Uh, the, the shift that we're seeing here, and this is sort of illustrated by this graph, we can see that uh, the industry sector, which is really manufacturing dominantly and mining as well in China, has, um, has grown but has stabilised. What is growing more quickly is the services sector. And this sort of stands to reason as we look at the sort of periods of economic development of a country, it begins in an agricultural phase, and a great indicator that I'm looking at here is steel intensity, it grams of steel per unit dollar of GDP to be able to run the economy. So in the early phases of growth in agriculture, steel intensity is low, but then it goes into the industrialisation phase, and for the German and US economy, steel intensity peaks until they reach about $12,000 GDP per capita, and then it starts to come back down again, so it's a bell-shaped curve. China is peaking in its steel intensity. I don't even know if I... 
I didn't have the steel intensity graph there, but it, it peaks and then it comes back down again. And as it does so, it shifts into an advanced service sector economy. So once the railway tracks have been laid once, they don't need to be put down again. Instead, the economic activity shifts to a bunch of office workers going over those tracks who work in education and health and research and a, and a whole, the, the service sector of the economy, which for Australia and New Zealand is by far and away the biggest part of the economy, 60 to 70%. So um, there's a shift in the China economy, basically, and that, that what does this new service sector economy actually want is the, the question for Australia and New Zealand, and how do we interact with it, how do we, we sell into it? You know, it's not just China, although every graph I look at is the same sort of one that John showed us with China massively out here distorting and, and driving it all and, and the rest here, and I, I think for the next 10 years or so, that's very much the case. Beyond 2025, some of the things change. We start to see other countries important, but I keep on landing on China because that's where the numbers are biggest almost always. For every young, that's in Australia, the ageing population, but it is a similar pattern across OECD countries. Uh, we're 14% to 25%. We're retiring later. Ages of retirement across OECD again. I'm just sort of being a bit lazy here and using Australia data over, overly. I shouldn't do that. But we're seeing a, a rise in um, retirement ages uh, and challenges for the productivity of the workforce as we have an aged population. I think the issue of tapered retirement models is likely to get on the agenda more um, in that somebody doesn't stop working when they reach retirement age and in theory the studies tell us your mental and physical health is better if you retain the right level of connection with the workforce. You can't be down a coal mine digging coal at 75 and have good mental and physical health but you could be on the surface training the next generation of coal miners how to do it more safely or better and fulfilling a different role and I think there is a, a requirement for employers to start to think about these tapered retirement models and productivity later in life. Life expectancy is going up as well. Um, youngest people being born today uh, in wealthy countries can expect uh, 105 years of life on average. Some suggest it might be someone out there has been born that will live to 150 based on analyses of uh, maximum age at death of people over time. Uh, so uh, life expectancy is, is, also, is also going up and maybe regenerative medicine may come to play and, create some interesting outcomes there. As Elizabeth Blackburn, the Tasmanian scientist who came up with, uh, treated the telomeres at the end of DNA strands with enzymes and found that the mice didn't just stop getting old, that the cell ageing process was re reversed and they got young and beautiful again. Only the downside was they died of cancer. So uh, there still is a market and I still think, you know, maybe pack that one into it. So uh, it's just a re regenerative medicine may do take us some, you know, these graphs that do this, it's, it's not always a line that just goes straight. Things can happen that cause big, big jumps and changes. OEC, obesity rates, this is by BMI and it is not really a great measure. Um, we need to get better at measuring this, but those are the, the data sets that I'm, the only ones I can access across OECD country, countries show this continued growth here. Um, it, obesity is a phenomenon that is not just wealthy countries, it is happening right across the world uh, and very much across Asia as well. So uh, it's just, the data isn't always as great there, but it's, it's definitely happening right across the world. Uh, and physical inactivity is part of this trend. I think the, there is a paper in Lancet titled The, the Global Epidemic of Physical Inactivity and they, they attribute some uh, sort of six or seven million deaths per annum to people not having enough physical activity that they require, so it's partly mingled in with that. Again, this is the sort of phenomena across a lot of OECD countries is the rise in healthcare expenditure. It's fueled by two things, ageing population, because the vast bulk of your healthcare expenditure happens in the last few years of your life. It's not a, it's not a flat line where it's the same throughout, it's in the, towards the end of your life, it's where you spend vast amounts more on healthcare. And as we have a greater percentage of the population in that space, that means healthcare costs overall are going to go up. But in addition to that is the chronic illness and lifestyle related illness for neurological illnesses, um, diabetes, um, cardiovascular, we're seeing multi-billion dollar jumps in costs uh, that, that are projected out to 2035, a lot of it related to diet and lifestyle. Digital immersion, this sort of change that is being brought about by the rapid growth and explosion in digital technology capabilities. And these are exponential growth curves. It's not a straight line that we should be putting through uh, digital, the digital economy. This, this one is device connectivity. How many things are plugged into other things, um, which according to Metcalf, and he came up with his theories in the 1960s, 
but there is meta-level functionality associated with a network. When we have one fax, it does nothing. Two faxes have a little bit of functionality. A network of 45 million faxes across the world has a big step change in functionality because the law firm in Jakarta signs the contract with the one in New York immediately and a new business ecosystem is built upon that because new things become possible. The network is, is more than the sum of its parts. Now the internet is not just faxes getting plugged into faxes, it's everything getting plugged into everything else. That Philips have introduced last year their range of personal personalised wireless lighting where the light bulbs have Ethernet connections or wireless connections that, that allow them to, so when the stock market's going bad it makes the room go greeny, grey colours and then bright orange when it's all looking good. But um, washing machines with Ethernet connections are also on the marketplace that you can find now so you can control them and manage them from your iPhone. They still can't find the socks though. <laughs> what, what it does though, and why the internet of things is significant is it's not the individual gadgets, it's if those washing machines are smart enough to be put on a coordinated cycle to reduce the electricity demand so that the peaks aren't there. It's, it's, the, level, it's the functions that can be built upon that of a hyper-connected um, city, hyper-connected agricultural supply chains and that's, that's the explosion in device connectivity that's about to happen. Data being moved around there, 90% of the data worldwide was created in the last two years according to IBM and that's, uh, this is a, a sh really frog in the pond situation of exponential growth. Um, computing power and speed. I did actually have a, a phone hookup with uh, the lady who does my job at Intel and does strategic foresight on, on behalf of them and you know she talks to the engineers who makes Moore's Law happen uh, and she asks them how much longer they can keep doing it for and they said 10 years. They have line of sight for 10 years to keep on making improvements and making things smaller and smaller inside the computer chips to keep achieving this, this um, number of transistors integrated circuit doubling at the same cost every 1.5 years. So out to 2025 they can see it happening and maybe beyond but they, they can't say. Um, then there is the prospect of sort of radical shifts in computing, quantum computers, where it's not binary on-off switches, it's unstable qubits, which can be in many places all at the same time. I don't totally understand it, but it is a, you know, it's tens of thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times faster. It would be a radical shift in what's possible. They, the company D-Wave Systems are saying they've done it, um, that NASA and Google invested in. Um, there are plenty of papers, though, in Science and Nature that are debating whether or not they did it. Um, they think they did and then a lot of other smart people think they didn't, but let's see how it goes. So I'm going to use an analogy here though for this, this shift that we see in the digital economy. Um, another, another unpleasant thing happening to frogs. So the ecologists downstairs have told me that uh, lily pads follow an exponential growth rate. This is an exotic pest species that is in Australia and the, they grow really quickly. It's, it's, they start with one, then two, then four, then eight. Uh, until the, um, the pond is covered and then the frog can't live in it because it can't jump in and out of the water and its habitat is destroyed. So here's the algebra question for a mean, mean to do it in the morning like this. Uh, but the area of lily pad doubles every day in this pond and it takes 19 days for the pond to be half covered. So it starts at one, then goes to two, then, then four and by 19 days, half of the surface area of the pond is covered. On what day is that pond completely covered with lily pads? Day 20, that's right, one day and we see the same amount of coverage. So the, the analogy here is to these exponential growth curves that are right across digital economy. The first 14 days, frog doesn't know anything's happening, right? It's got no visual clues or signs, really just a tiny bit of a pick up there at the end, but it won't see much of a problem. From day 14 to day 18, the frog suspects something. Every day it wakes up, it sees more lily pads and it's wondering what's going on. It doesn't diagnose until we get to day 18. Now, if it's a competitive pond with plenty of other frogs in there and they were smarter than the, our frog, they might have jumped first and then the frog has got nowhere to jump. That's the analogy though I would bring to the digital economy, that it, it looks a lot different beyond 2020. It's an exponential growth curve. Not all parts of it are the same, but we are potentially thrown into a very different world which requires diagnosis closer to here. Like, do I have the Uber data here? I don't. But in, in January this year, um, Uber released its data on drivers in the United States since 2012. And it is this exact line, right? It's a flat line which gets to about 2013, 2014, and then it just booms. And the taxi companies couldn't respond to where they've responded now. And they, they, they're responding now. In, when I booked my travel for this trip, um, black and white taxis now have an Uber-like app which worked really well for me. 
but this is 2016. Right? We, they needed it in 2010, so that it was there was no shift in the marketplace. It was possible, and that was that was too late. That's the the challenge in responding to this digital economy. Artificial intelligence is getting better and better, more powerful, but there's still plenty of stuff people can do better than the machines. Uh, after seven years' effort by scientists from UC Berkeley, a robot can fold a towel in 20 minutes. So they, they're a smart group of people. They're not dumb. They're world-leading best robotics. It's because of the irregular and unstructured nature of a town. Now, we've finished um, a study on the future of work and what jobs look like. I think there's been quite a bit of thinking in, Tasma in New Zealand on this as well. And uh, there's no two ways about it. Artificial intelligence and the digital revolution will change what work is possible. And we've had a whole lot in the media about 47% of jobs being replaced by computers and robots, which I don't quite agree with, but we see shifts. This comes from the Australian photographic industry. And we can see two types of jobs there. One of those jobs is repetitive, structured, rules-based, and uh, highly automatable. And it has been and will be automated. When you order a print today, no person is really involved. You just upload the photo enter your size requirements, whether you want to frame, hit, print and deliver, a machine does it and it's, it's sent to you. But the other part of that industry is people who require creativity, they have to deal with complexity, they have to exercise judgment, they must have um, EQ, IQ as well, EQ as well as IQ, emotional intelligence in addition to that. The wedding photographer's got to be able to know when they're wanted, when they're not, and solve all it. The, the robots and computers can't do that. So this is the sort of shift we're starting to see in labour markets is towards, you know, there's a lot of other graphs for different industries that we constructed that look like this. What are the jobs that my kids who are five and nine get? They're more like the green line rather than the red line. Porous boundaries is what happens and why we see Ronald Coase's theory of the firm challenged. It's the rise and rise of platform economies. So um, the banking and finance sector is seeing the beginnings of a lot of platform models that, you know, what can a bank do that Harmony, for example, can't, or society run rate setter that basically match lenders to borrowers in much more efficient mechanisms. You know, there's a big trust issue that people don't want to lend or borrow other than via a bank at the moment, but we can certainly see how these platforms via improved metrics are able to get a, get over that trust issue and then they can operate at lower costs. There's also regulations that make banks do what they do. Um, the platforms can get around those regulations and will just often not care and just start doing what they're doing. Well, there's the, the number of Uber drivers in the United States graph, which is the frog in the pond situation. Once the marketplace is likely to change, action needs to happen in those first few years, not the last ones. Okay, lastly, great expectations. You know, the rise in the online world is also associated with negatives of cybercrime, privacy concerns, intrusive marketing, information overload, and generally online burnout. I don't, I don't, this is a funny video. I don't think we've actually got time to watch this one. It's called Google Analytics in Real Life Online Checkout. It'll have you in stitches. But it shows the pain that might be associated for this individual buying a loaf of bread if everything that we have in the online world was done uh, in the real world and why people often stop wanting to buy the thing online and do it in, in, in the real world instead. So the digital models at work are often transparent and we focused on what really matters. You probably go past quite a few coffee shops on the way to work to get to the one you like. It still is caffeine, but that's pretty naive for us to think that that's all that mattered for you in that experience. Ambience, um, did the barista smile at you and have a conversation? Was it fair trade? There is a bunch of other goods that you wrap around that. You know, uh, the electricity company doesn't sell me electricity, they sell me light, warmth and heat. Qantas didn't, or Air New Zealand didn't sell me a seat on a plane, they sell, sold me the ability to come here and talk to you. And this is the end of good product that I'm consuming. If there is a digital alternative that lets that happen, better and more efficiently, that's, that's the one that the consumer will start to shift towards. So the, the challenge around high value nutrition is also fully and deeply understanding what the digital uh, consume, what the consumer of the future really wants and, and delivering on that. And the digital can be a barrier to that or it can help you massively connect to so the point that the food customer in Shanghai swipes their iPhone over the tomatoes from New Zealand, sees the entire supply chain, gets to talk to the farmer and gets to know and develop an emotional connection. And pr the provenance question, where my food came from, is answered. That's the sort of level that I think digital wants to do, but it has to facilitate that. The innovation imperative runs through this. This stuff, these challenges that I put up here are solved via 
deeper, better, bolder, and bigger ideas. That's a, that's the fuel source for the modern economy of, of of America, of Australia, of New Zealand. Is ideas is is where we're at. Ideas is what's going to see productivity growth happen. Um, yeah, that's Australia's productivity graph, and Paul Krugman has a sobering thought for us that in the short term this, this matters, in the long term it's everything for wealth creation. If we continue to see productivity decline in OECD countries, we make our kids poorer. There's a lot of thinking about how innovation should happen, but I need to work, move towards a wrap up. Um, I'm building a research team, I've got a, it's been a while since we've had a growth imperative in CSIRO, but I've got one to build a team that does this strategic foresight work of, of this is a snapshot of what we do about building scenarios, understanding trends and helping people make decisions. So thank you very much for your time, uh, much appreciated. <laughs>